morning, all. <clears throat> First service, I said, y'all can, can remain standing. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> That's kind of how they responded. Now, y'all go ahead and sit down. <laughs> glad to see you. Glad to be here. Glad uh, to be with our best friends in the whole wide world, Steve and Connie Corona, and, of course, your pastors, Micah and Melissa. We love those guys. Proud of them. I tell them all the time, proud of you for carrying on and it's such a good opportunity to be here. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk on everybody's favorite subject for a moment. It's called love. When we say to Christians, do you love each other? Or how do you show your love? Usually I get this response. Well, I love you, brother, to somebody. And then you turn around and you fuss about their hair or their whatever or their whatever and the rest of the week, you act like the world. And we think we love God. We think that we're walking in the God kind of love when actually we're not. Because what we're doing is we're, we're very surface, I love you. And also it's just very superficial and not genuine. And there's no power there. You know, Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 says that faith worketh by love. And so we have to understand that if there's a, there's a power there and we've got to know how to access that power, right? Four of you in the house. Isn't that awesome? You're going to have to help me out here today. So, you know, uh, if I say something good, you can amen. If I say something bad, you can say amen twice. No booing, please. So uh, we'll just talk about this for a little bit. Um, if you want to go ahead and find your uh, place in your Bible, <clears throat> if you have one with you to to Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians 3. You know, I'm just minding my own business one day studying the Bible. Now, I'm not a, a, a Bible scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm a student. But I love the Word, and there's life there. And uh, for me to be victorious in my life, I've got to have a deeper understanding of the Word. And, and so I'm just minding my own business doing a word study um, out of Ephesians chapter 3. Actually, it started with me teaching on the prayers of the Apostle Paul, which you'll find the two, the two main sections in Ephesians chapter 1, 18 and on, and Ephesians 3, 17 and on. And so I'm just minding my own business reading through this, and it just kind of came to me as I read this that when we talk about love, we talk about it one-dimensionally. I love you, brother. But there's so much more to it. Actually, in this scripture I'm going to read here in just a second, you're going to see that there's actually seven different dimensions of love. I'm going to talk about the foundation of it today, uh, just so you kind of know this is where we start. And so Ephesians chapter 3, I will start in verse, verse 17. Actually, uh, let's just start in verse 16. It's all good. Uh, the Apostle Paul's praying to the church of Ephesus. Now, you know, just so you know this, the church of Ephesus was the most spiritual church. He could really dig in and get into the word with them. Uh, the church of Corinth, on the other hand, was the church that was behind no one in spiritual gifts. But the Apostle Paul said to him, I have so much deeper meat to give you, but you can't handle it yet. I still have to feed you milk. So, pray, you know, just the gifts of the Spirit don't make you spiritual. An understanding of the Word makes you spiritual. So he's praying for them because of this. He's praying over in the church of Ephesus here in Ephesians chapter 3 that I would grant, that he would grant to you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. So here's what he's praying. He's praying that you'd be strengthened. It's my prayer for you when I pray for Living Word Family Church that you'd be strengthened on the inner man. But now here's how it's going to happen. Because we've already said, Galatians 5, 6 says, faith worketh. The word worketh is the Greek word, energeo, and it means to be energized, to be activated, to move forward. It's always an action word. So faith is activated by love. That Christ would dwell in your hearts by faith, that you... So you can start counting with me. First of all, be rooted and grounded in love. There's the first two. That's what we're going to talk about today. So that you would be able to comprehend. In other words, if you don't get these two down, 
you can't comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, depth, height, and to know, be intimately acquainted with the love of Christ, which passes all understanding, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, how many of you like to be filled with all the fullness of God? Good. That's a good group. That's a good, good amount. So the word filled in the Greek, it's just such an interesting Greek word. I love this word. But actually, if you translate this word over into, uh, into English, it would be so crammed full that there's not room for anything else. And so he's praying that you be so crammed full of God's goodness and fullness that there's not room for anything else. Think about this for a second. If you were so crammed full of the goodness of God, you wouldn't have any doubt, be no lack, be no sickness. You'd be smiling all the time. And maybe you just, I just like if my husband would smile once in a while. Well, here's the prayer you ought to be praying. But, you know, here's the deal. It, it comes at a price. <clears throat> because the next verse is the one we all can quote. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. You know, every promise in the, in the word, in the book, every promise, there's always a qualifier because God's no respecter of persons. Have you ever asked this question? Why is it that it seems like God's always doing something in their life but not in mine or not in somebody else's? Something over there, something. Why is it? And the answer is, God is no respecter of persons. He reigns on the just and the unjust. The issue is, do you qualify? Well, that doesn't sound fair. Well, it has to be. It's just. And so, when we think about this, let's find the qualifier. So, if the promise is God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, there has to be a qualifier. What is the qualifier? According to the power... That worketh, that word worketh in the Greek is the same one we saw a minute ago. It's, it's energeo and it means to be energized, to be given power so that an ability can work in you. So what is the qualifier? That the power worketh in us. Now, what power are we talking about? Because some people will say, well, it's the power of God. Yes. How's it activated? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. How's it activated? It's the power of the word, yes. How's it activated? By this power, this power is the power of love. See, you've got to keep things in context. We take Ephesians 3.20 out, we just say God's able to do it, so I'm going to go sit and, and play video games and wait on him to do it. No, you've got to do your part, and your part is to understand and walk in the love of God. So, with that in mind, let's dig in here a little bit. I'm going to show you the foundation. So if you're taking notes and one of our title for this the title for this would be the starting point the starting point of love starting point because once you get the starting point down you can do the other okay are you ready all right here we go so once again verse 17 says that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you be rooted and grounded so we're going to deal with being rooted and grounded today so the word rooted is an interesting Greek word because it is the Greek word ridzo, ridzo. And the word ridzo means this. It means to be rooted, to, to have depth, and it could be translated over into English like the tap root. Now, if you know anything, I don't know a lot, but if you know anything about, about vegetation trees and so forth, so they all have a tap root. That's the bigger root that goes the deepest, and it goes the deepest so to give stability. Just think about a tree for a second. When a tree is in the midst of a storm, it may sway and it may dance a little bit, but it won't fall over if the taproot's established. And that's the picture that the Apostle Paul is painting for us today is that you have to have that taproot being rooted in love to the point that when stuff comes, anybody ever had stuff come at you? You say, well, why did that one stand? Why did that one make it through? 
because they had this, this, they were rooted. Now, I'm going to explain what rooted is in just a second, but I want you to get the picture. Because it's so vitally important that you understand, man, this is, this is vital for my success. This is, my vi- this is vital for my survival. Because when stuff starts happening, have you, ever, have you said this? Because I know you got, I, I, you, you're very faithful here. You're committed here. You love this church. You love your pastors. Um, and you receive from them. But have you ever said this? I don't know how people in the world make it in a day like today. There's no hope. There's no comfort. It's just turmoil everywhere. How do they make it? And the answer is, for us, the way we make it is that we have a taproot that holds us steady. Now, what is that taproot? Glad you asked. Psalm 22. Psalm 22, 3 says this. I've got two scriptures on this point for you. So Psalm 22, 3 says this. It says, but God, thou art holy. That word holy means separated. Uh, that thou inhabitest the praises of your people. This says, you think, well, what does that have to do with love? I'll show you. But this says that God inhabits our praise. Now, we think about that just means he shows up at praise during music. And while they're singing and did an awesome job today, while they're singing, God shows up. And after you quit singing, then God goes back somewhere else. That's not true. The praises of, of his people, that word, that praise there is any acknowledgement of him in your life. When you acknowledge him as Lord of your life, that's praise. But here's the point I want you to see. God said, the word says that he inhabits. The word inhabits in the Hebrew, an interesting Hebrew word, because it means this. It means to set up, to come and settle in, to enjoy the presence of those who are praising him. God enjoys hanging out with you. And it goes beyond that because it means to settle in or even to, if you're ready for this, to marry. It's that intimate. It's just like this past week, and I guess we're still in it some, where we get together for Thanksgiving. And you just sit and smile with family. I hope you do. I hope it's not like, oh, dear God, let's get out of here. But... um, you just get around family and it's just so comfortable and you just go, ah, oh, this is so nice and I enjoy spending time with them. It's like that except on a greater degree. Because that's what God does when you get together. God shows up because he wants to be, you know, you were created, by the way, to fellowship with him. You're not a knot on a log in the body of Christ. You're not a wart on the little toe of the body of Christ. You are special. And he loves hanging out with just you. Sometimes I just, I'm sitting in my prayer chair and say, hey, God, let's just hang out. He's good with that. And so we understand this and then go to the next scripture I want you to see is, it, you, might, you might have read this before. You might have heard somebody say this. John chapter 3, verse 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave away, he gave away his only begotten son so that you might have salvation. God loves you that much. So here's the taproot. Are you ready? So I said all that to set us up for this. The taproot of love is having a revelation, understanding. You know, you can have head knowledge, but if you don't do anything with it, it it doesn't amount to anything. It's got to get from here to here. This has to be the very essence of your being. You have to know that God loves you. You've got to come to that place where you know that no matter what goes on. See, I can't. I grew up in a, in, a, in a somewhat traditional church. I won't mention the name, the denomination, but we got our sermons from the, from the National Geographic and the local newspaper usually. A lot of growing up there, right? Um, and so I was always told, because when I would get back, when I would do things bad, I know nobody else in here has ever done something that they later felt bad about, but uh, when I do things bad, uh, my family, while they did this, I don't know, but they would say, you, you better back up. It, uh, God's going to strike him with lightning for that one. 
And so I grew up, if you'd hear a clap of thunder, I'd run for cover. Because <laughs> I was, a, you know, I, I mean, I didn't, you know, anyway, doesn't matter. How bad I was or not, doesn't matter, but still. But anyway, I thought, you know, I thought God's mad at me three quarters of the time. And if you grow up in that feeling, if you grow up in that environment, there's no hope. God, I need you. Oh, no, he's still mad at me for last week. God, I need some help here. God, some way, somehow, if you would, will somebody pray for me that's closer to God than I am, that God would help me because he's mad at me, but maybe not mad at you? I mean, you know, that's, that's chaos. You have to have the revelation. No matter what goes on in life, no matter how good you've been or bad, because God loves you based on his decision, not on you. By the way, there are. There are four different Greek words for the word love. Uh, and we need to understand what kind of love God operates. God doesn't love you because you love him. God loves you because he is love. It's his nature. So the four words here that are real quick. Number one is agape. Agape love is a decision love. This is a love where I have made a decision to follow God, to love God, to give my all to him, it's, you know, and he does that for us. Before you were born, before any of us were born, God made a decision, I'm going to love them because I want them to fellowship with me and I need to fellowship with them. So that's number one, agape. Number two is phileo. Phileo, it's where we get the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love because of this Greek word phileo, which means brotherly love. Brother Hagin said it this way. He said, it, it, phileo love is I love you if you love me, I'll spit on you if you spit on me. Now, I don't necessarily think you should act that way. <laughs> Might not be the best way to do it, but nevertheless, it's, it, this is it. I love you if you love me. If you don't love me, it's all off. That is very conditional. That is very um, transitional. And it's not the way that God operates. God operates in agape. So you got agape, you got phileo. The next one you have is eros, and that is the word for a very selfish love. It's all about me, 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 me. You ever met somebody that thought the world, rather than turning on axis, revolves around them? It's all about how you treat them? That's not God. Although we've been taught that. Religion has taught us that. If you do something bad, God's just, you know, he's not obligated. The fourth word, just so you'll know these four words, the fourth word for, for love is the word storge, S-T-O-R-G-A, storge. And storge, it means loyalty. It means actually deeper, a family loyalty, like you guys. This is your family. When I prayed about what to name this church back before we got here, I actually we had the name of the church before we had the church, even before we knew where we were coming. And it had to be based on the word being the living word, and it had to be based on family. And you are a family. This is your family. You do realize this is who you run to when you need help. And so those are the four words. But of those four words, God loves us with agape. For God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here again, that's got to be a revelation. How do you make the word a revelation? How do you make this a revelation in your life? By staying with it over and over and over and over and over again. Actually, let's just do it right now. Go with me to, um, to Joshua chapter 1. Real quick, <clears throat> and uh, I, I kind of want to just uh, throw this out now. I actually did it, first service did it a little bit later, but let's do it right now. Because you've got to understand how to get a revelation in your life. Oh, the, the, have you ever been at lunch on Sunday afternoon? Or you get home and somebody says, well, how did the preacher do today? Oh, he did awesome. It was really good. What did he say? Well, it was really good. Well, what was the topic on? It was, man, it was really good. That means it was here. 
because if it was just here, it, you know, it, it, I don't know about you, but it leaks out sometimes. I've learned I have to lean on this side because it doesn't lean out as quick as on this side. No. Uh, it, leans out, it, it leaks out if you just have head knowledge. How many of you have ever taken an exam for work or anything else for that matter? And, you know, about five days after you took the exam, you're thinking, I sure hope I don't have to use any of that information. <laughs> I took an exam several years ago, and they told me, they told me, just get this in your head. You won't ever need it, but we have to grade you on it. Well, thanks a whole lot. Why am I doing this? But that's what they said. So it was just here. I, I didn't apply it. I didn't use it. It's just here. Joshua chapter 1 tells us how it becomes revelation. Now, let me set it up for you. Joshua starts with this phrase from Father God, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you take the people into the promised land. And Mo, uh, Moses was a mighty man, right? I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Joshua thought Moses was so wow. And he was second class. Joshua said, if I can just be at his feet. A lot of people do that today. A lot of people think that they're not quite the person that this other person is. And if, you know, so they really have put somebody between them and Father God. Trust me when I say this to you, because I've done it for years and years and finally got over it. You're not competing with other people. You're competing with your own potential, what God's called you to do. But here, Joshua is trying to get his head, as we would say, his head wrapped around, I'm going to, I'm going to do what Moses didn't do. That, that's, a, that's something big to carry. And we can go through all the Bible and we can find people that didn't quite feel like they measured up. Joshua to Moses, Elisha to Elijah, John the Baptist to Jesus, Timothy to, I mean, we could go on and on and on and on. Come to find out, they all were saying, actually, you know, Joshua, I'm sorry, uh, Elisha before Elijah went up in, in, um, in a whirlwind, when, before he went up, he said, what can I give you? And Elisha said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Why? Because he felt he was half the man. Come to find out, he got a double portion of his spirit, and he did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. So even though Elisha thought, well, I'm just half the man Elijah is, come to find out, in his own place, this is so important for somebody, in your own place, you're as strong and as important as anybody else on the planet. Don't, don't let the devil tell you, oh, I just, what do you do at church? Oh, I, I clean the bathrooms. The number one reason people do not come back to a church is dirty bathrooms. So actually, think about this. If you just clean the restrooms, and you can see Pastor Tammy right after service, and she'll fix you right now. <laughs> but for people to just clean the bathrooms... It takes away a major roadblock in people's lives from coming back to church. That's huge. Just thought I'd throw that in for extra. That didn't cost anything, but anyway. So here it is. How do we get, I'm trying to get to my, my message here. How do we get revelation? So God said, only be strong and courageous, for I will, I will be with you. Here's the thought. I will be with you. I'll never leave you. I will be there. I love you. I will guide you the whole way. And then he said this to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night until you observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then I add this and only then will you make your way prosperous. And then I add this in and only then will you make, have great success. So I have, when I read that, people say, that's cool. I, yeah, I, I know I've got to meditate the word. How do I do that? And right here, I want to say this to you. The Bible tells us the answer right there. And we think it means every morning and night, so that means I've got to read the Scriptures 24-7. I can't do that. So they give up. But now here, I'm going to show you, this is how, you, this is how it, become, it goes from head knowledge to
to Revelation. Here it is, right here. Let not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Here it is, that you may observe to do. Observe to do means this. You can see yourself doing it. When it, come, when it becomes revelation, it becomes revelation when you say, hey, I can see that. It becomes revelation when it, we're talking about the love of God when you know it doesn't matter what's going on in my life. God loves me. He's not done with me. He wants me to fulfill and have a long, successful life. So God's already got a plan because he loves me. That must become paramount before you can walk in love toward anybody else. you got to know, hey, I'm good. I don't need, you know, so many people, good day, this is going a whole different direction. Uh, you, you're, you know, some people, uh, I, I need other people to validate me so I know, so I feel loved. I used to be that, I used to, you know, is, are we good? You know, uh, I need you to say something nice to me because that validated me. The relationship wasn't about what I can impart to you. The revelation or, or what I felt was I need you to tell me I'm okay because I came from a family where I was told, you know, I told they said you know, if I did something wrong that the lightning was going to strike me. But they told me I'd never mount anything. Be just like my dad. My dad was an alcoholic. He died when I was a senior in high school. And they told me I'd be just like him. Won't amount to anything. And I believed that until I met my wife and met her family and they introduced me to Jesus and come to find out that was not right. Come to find out I could amount to anything I wanted to amount to. So, but it's got to get on the inside of you. I know that I am God's favor. I know that God loves me. I know he loves you the same. I'm not taking anything away from you, but I know I'm good, that he loves me. And you've got to get that revelation. But not only do you need to be rooted in, in love, you've got to be grounded. Now, the word grounded, it's another interesting Greek word. I love these Greek words. They're so picturesque. But it is, it is the Greek word. Let me get over here to the page so I pronounce it right. I had somebody the other day say, you know, you're not really saying it right. And I said, were you there when Paul wrote this? <laughs> he said, no, but I've been to, to the island of Crete and they speak Greek. I said, do they, Greek, do they speak Koine Greek from that period? Because I had a talk with a person who spoke fluent Greek and she said, it's totally different. Doesn't sound anything like it did then. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So here's the word. It's the word themoeo, themoeo, and it means this. It means to lay a basis for. So we could say it this way. To be rooted is to have the taproot, to know that God loves you. Number two, you've got to have the foundation of love. Now, where do we find the foundation of love? We find it in Mark chapter 12. The Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, the Pharisees were the people of the law, had to keep everything to the law. The Sadducees was this group, this religious group that had some really weird ideas. One was that there is no resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> Thought I'd throw that out there, but that's how I remember it. You know, I, there's things you got to do to remember stuff, right? Okay. Just act like I didn't say that. Just say, just think to yourself, I still love him, even though that was corny as all get out. I still, it'll be okay. So here it is. So they were, they were questioning Jesus, trying to find out if he was the real Messiah. And they said, tell us, Master, what is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus here in Mark 12, verse 30, he says this. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Two verses put together. And, of course, they said you've answered correctly. So the foundation of love is this. You've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So real quickly, let me just give you those four so you'll have it, so you know. Because this is the foundation of love. You can't actually walk in the power of love if you don't have the foundation right. Number one, you got to know 
everybody can turn their back on me. Everybody can just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not interested, but I still know God loves me. You've got to have that. Secondly, you've got to have the foundation. You've got to love the Lord your God with everything. First of all, with your heart. The word heart in the Greek is the Greek word cardia, cardia. And it's the word used, actually, if you go to the old city of Jerusalem today, there's a road right in the middle of the old city, and it's called the old cardia. And it's called, the word cardia means the middle ground. So your heart on a, um, on a level is the middle ground. It's where decisions are made. It's where your intellect, your emotions, your will all come together and create this middle ground where decisions are made. So actually, Paul, uh, Jesus here is saying, you need to love the Lord your God with all your decisions. They've got to be godly decisions. Duh, but they do. Number two, you've got to love the Lord your God with all your soul. This is the Greek word suke, and it means emotions. You've got to keep your, your, your emotions in line with what the word says. Oh, dear God, this is going to take me out. Oh, dear God, this is bad. This is not getting any better. No, you've got to grab hold of that and say, no, the word says I am a victor in all things. No, the word says that I am an overcomer. So I've got to hold. God loves me, so therefore I can hold to this. The third one is that you've got to love the Lord your God with all your mind. And this is the Greek word, dianoia. Dianoia. Dia means to penetrate, to separate. Noia means the mind. So we've got to let the word of God penetrate beyond natural thinking knowledge to get down in our heart to where we can process the thoughts. How many of you have a thought? I'm just wondering. Let me say it a different way. How many of you have a thought that you know as soon as, you, as it comes in your head, that's not God? You've got to be able to process that thing. Oh, no, that's not God, so I'm not letting that in. And then the last one is strength. <clears throat> You've got to love the Lord your God with all your strength. And that word there is the word for force, and it means with your ability. So we could stop right there. I'm not. They're just going to play some music for me to get me to the end here. But you just got to understand that... First, you've got to know that God loves you. Then you've got to love him. But then it goes on to say, and then love your neighbor, are you ready? As yourself. That means you've got to have a healthy love and respect for you. Oh, now, I don't want to get prideful, brother. Listen, the church is so far from prideful, it's not even funny. We don't have a real healthy, some, most of the time, a real healthy self-love for ourselves. Can I just tell you real quick? Some of you I know, some of you I've known for years, 20 plus years. Some of you I don't know personally, but I can guarantee this. You are the greatest at what you're called to do. Nobody's called to do what you're called to do. If it's cleaning the bathroom, it's holding a door open for somebody, whatever it is, nobody is like you. And we need to get to that understanding. We need to get that revelation. Hey, I am somebody important. Do you know that God created you in his image and likeness? He didn't make junk. You need to get beyond that. Oh, I'm just a, you know, I've already said it, a wart on the little toe of the body of Christ. You need to get over that. I'm somebody special. Nobody can do what I can do. Now, people can do things like it. People can do some things. Nobody can do what you can do but you. You just got to open the door. Kick that door open and realize I need to move toward my potential because God needs me. Had this guy in our church after he got this revelation. I taught it a couple times. He was driving down the interstate going back to Radford University one day, rolled the window down and screamed as loud as he could, I love me. We've got to do that. We've got to break out of this thing of thinking I'm not worthy. Nobody would miss me if I was gone. God would. 
God has a plan for each of you. It's a great plan. And you just need to say, I'm here, I'm available, I'll do it because that's me. Nobody can do what I can do. And be okay with that. Be okay that you are something special to God because God loves you. You should love you. Amen. Did you get anything out of this today?